Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Design Your Own Airplanes. In this video, we're going to be learning about lift force. For those of you who are new to the channel, these videos are dedicated to explaining and demonstrating aerospace engineering principles so that you can design and build your own model airplanes that fly. In an earlier video, we learned how to build this simple and inexpensive glider that you can use to experiment with different airplane designs. If you have not already built one, I've put a link in the description to the build video. In this video, we're going to be learning about lift force, which our planes need in order to fly, and how to produce it. This video is kind of a continuation of our last video about parasite drag force, so I would recommend going back and watching that one if you have not already done so. In today's video, we're going to talk about three things. First, we're going to learn about how lift force is produced when the angle of attack is increased. Second, we're going to learn about the lift equation, and we'll take a look at some demonstrations of how different design choices affect the speed of your planes. Third, we're going to be learning about how you can produce even more lift force by adding camber to your wings. In our video about basic glider physics, we learned that drag is a force that acts opposite to the direction our planes are flying, while lift is a force that acts at a right angle to the direction of flight. Last time we left off with this shape, called an airfoil. As you may recall, an airfoil is the shape that you see when you look at an airplane wing from the side. We learned how airfoils are good for reducing parasite drag force, but as we're going to find out in this video, they are also very good for producing lift force. As we talked about in our previous video, when a fluid flows around an object, the object exerts a force on the fluid to change its direction. The fluid then exerts an equal and opposite pressure force on the object. This means that to create lift force, we need to redirect the airflow downwards in order to create an equal and opposite force upwards. We'll start by drawing a line from the leading edge of our airfoil to the trailing edge. This is called the cord line. The distance from the leading edge of the airfoil to the trailing edge is called the cord length. We can also measure the thickness of the airfoil, which is usually expressed as a percentage of the cord length. We can create lift by tilting the airfoil upwards, like this, as the air flows past it. We measure how much the airfoil is tilted upwards by measuring the angle between the cord line and the airflow. This is called the angle of attack. As the angle of attack is increased, Air striking the bottom of the airfoil has a force exerted on it to deflect it downwards. The air then exerts an equal and opposite pressure force on the bottom of the airfoil that is greater than the free stream pressure, as denoted by the red vectors pointing towards the surface. Meanwhile, on the top of the airfoil, the air curves around the top surface and flows downwards as well. Because air always flows from high pressure to low pressure, we know that for the streamlines to curve, the pressure on the top of the airfoil must be significantly lower than the free stream pressure, as denoted by blue vectors pointing away from the surface. Because the pressure force on the bottom of the airfoil is higher than the free stream pressure, and the pressure force on the top is lower than the free stream pressure, the result is a net upwards force, called lift. Increasing the angle of attack by tilting the airfoil upwards even further produces even more lift force. At this point, we're going to set aside our airfoils for a few minutes and talk about the lift equation. The lift equation, shown here, is used to calculate the strength of the lift force acting on an object. For those of you who watched the previous video, you'll notice that the lift equation is almost identical to the drag equation. As before, the strength of the lift force is equal to one half multiplied by the fluid density, the square of the velocity, the area of the wing, and the only difference is that the drag coefficient has been replaced with the lift coefficient. As we discussed in our video about basic glider physics, the lift force is approximately equal to the weight of the plane, assuming that you're not in too steep of a dive. The weight of the plane is equal to its mass, multiplied by acceleration from gravity. One of the best ways to demonstrate the lift equation is to change each of the variables and observe changes in the airplane's speed. We can rearrange the lift equation to make an equation for the plane's speed, shown here. The first variable we'll look at is the weight of the plane. In our video about basic glider physics, we learned that lift force has to be strong enough to counteract the weight of the airplane, 
This means that heavier planes need to generate more lift force. We're going to be using this plane for the demonstration. It currently has a mass of about 110 grams, but we can increase that by adding on more weight. When we compare the videos side by side, we can see that the heavier airplane flies faster than the lighter plane. This is because the heavier plane needs more lift force to counteract its weight and therefore has to fly faster to generate enough lift force to stay airborne. The next variable we'll look at is the area of the wing. In this demonstration, we'll first use this plane that has a wing area of 160 square inches. Next, we're going to be using this large glider that has a wing area of 360 square inches. I've added more weights onto the small plane so that each glider weighs the same amount. This time, when we compare the videos side by side, we can see that the plane with the larger wing flies more slowly than the plane with the smaller wing. This is because larger wings produce more lift force, which means that the plane with the larger wing doesn't have to fly as fast to produce enough lift force to stay airborne. These two demonstrations show how changing the weight and wing area of your planes affects how fast they fly. This brings us to the subject of wing loading. If we look back at our speed equation, the wing loading is either the mass or the weight of the plane divided by its wing area. Planes with higher wing loading fly faster, and planes with lower wing loading fly slower. You can experiment with different wing loadings and different speeds by adding or removing weight from your plane, or by installing bigger or smaller wings. It's difficult to demonstrate the effects of changing the air density since this depends on the temperature, the pressure, and the humidity, but you would see similar results. Airplanes flying in less dense air would need to fly faster to generate enough lift force to stay airborne, whereas planes flying in more dense air would fly slower. That just leaves us with the lift coefficient, but to understand this concept, we're going to need to return to our airfoil. As we discussed earlier, Increasing the angle of attack increases the strength of the lift force generated by the airfoil. This means that the lift coefficient is greater at higher angles of attack. This graph, called a lift curve, shows how the lift coefficient increases as the angle of attack increases. This means that when an airplane tilts up, it has a higher lift coefficient and produces more lift force. And when an airplane tilts down, it has a lower lift coefficient and produces less lift force but we can take the lift coefficient even further. So far, we've been working with airfoils that are symmetric across the cord line, but we can increase the lift coefficient and generate a stronger lift force if we add a curve into the airfoil. This curve is called camber. A cambered airfoil works by directing the airflow downwards more effectively than a symmetric one. Because the airflow is being forced downwards more, then by Newton's third law, the equal and opposite upwards force is greater as well. Camber is measured by drawing a center line on the airfoil halfway between the top and bottom surfaces. The amount of camber is the maximum distance between the cord line and the center line and is usually expressed as a percentage of the cord length. Here are a few examples of what airfoils with different amounts of camber look like. We can add more camber to our gliders by putting a larger curve into the wings. Here's another graph that shows lift curves of airfoils with different cambers. We can see that airfoils with more camber have greater lift coefficients for the same angle of attack. Keep in mind though, this graph is for two-dimensional airfoils. In our next video, we're going to be talking about what happens to the lift and drag coefficients when we move to three-dimensional wings. Since airfoils with more camber produce more lift force, they can lift heavier planes. Now we've learned how airfoils produce lift and we've demonstrated the lift equation, but there's still one more topic we need to cover, and that is stalls. As you've probably guessed, we can't just continue to increase the angle of attack forever and continue to generate more lift. When the angle of attack is increased too much, the streamlines are unable to follow the curve around the top of the airfoil and separate from the surface. This creates a turbulent wake, just like we saw in the drag force video. When the angle of attack is increased to the point where the flow separates, the airfoil is said to have stalled. When this happens, the lift force stops increasing and the drag force increases significantly as well. Stalls are very dangerous for airplanes and can often cause crashes if lift force is lost. This is an example of a plane that tilts upwards too much and stalls. 
The angle of attack that the stall occurs at, called the stall point, depends on the shape of the airfoil and the flight conditions, such as speed and air density. Usually, though, the stall point is somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees. Well, that wraps it up for this video. We've learned how airfoils produce lift when the angle of attack and the camber are increased. We've learned about the lift equation and demonstrated the effects of changing a plane's weight and wing area on its speed. And we've learned about the dangers of stalls. Over our next few videos, we're going to discuss what happens when we move from two-dimensional airfoils to three-dimensional wings. Then we'll put all the pieces together to maximize the flight distance and flight time of our planes. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos, and thanks for watching.